we have to have systems where unconflicted experts examine the data. Because if you have a uh, financial relationship with companies, whether it's football, whether it's a chemical, whether it's alcohol, I think there's a lot of evidence that you can't see what is obviously there and can be seen by people who are unconflicted. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Let's be clear, we're not against capitalism. If we focus mostly on what's not working, it's because we want to try to fix it. One of our common interests is corporate governance, a fancy term that can be simply explained as how to prevent companies from behaving badly. This explains our obsession with scandals, fraud, and any major screw-ups. We want to know what can we do to stop it, or at least minimize them. Capitalism is not a predetermined machine, but a system of incentive that shape people's behavior. Does capitalism fail because its incentives are too strong, not strong enough, or because they've not adapted to the complexity of the modern world? So we decided to dedicate two episodes to at least some of the enablers, the professionals who are hired to help corporations escape the consequences of their actions. Today's episode is closer to Luigi's world, the world of scientific experts for hire. The next episode will be dedicated to the world of lawyers for hire. So we're missing... The journalist, we're going to have to dedicate an episode to them. <laughs> and uh, we fair. already have an episode on the consultant that are my, more in my camp. And uh, uh, people can listen to our episode on uh, making say consulting and it could be part of the series, even if it was not thought in this term. But to help our discussion today, we decided to bring a real scientist who is critical of how scientists behave. His name is David Michaels, whose recent book, The Triumph of Doubt, argues that far too often what appears to be science is really advocacy, usually for powerful corporate interests. He's now a professor at George Washington University, but before he led the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, better known as OSHA, under President Obama, and was uh, President Clinton's Assistant Secretary of Energy for Environment, Health, and Safety. Michael's core idea is the concept of mercenary science, by which he means scientists who are paid, and paid very well, let's stipulate, to produce studies that aren't designed to better understand the world or to help make the world a better place, but rather to defend products or practices that have come under fire for being unsafe, and yet which make a lot of money for corporate America. Michaels argues that sort of like Macbeth, the truth eventually does out, but only after corporations have continued to rake in money and after much damage has been done. He writes this, Rare is the CEO of today who, in the face of public concern about a potentially dangerous product, says, let's hire the best scientists to figure out if the problem is real, and then, if it is, stop making this stuff. Wouldn't that be nice? Instead, Michaels argues, they open the big tobacco playbook, which says it's always easier to dispute the science than debate the policy. He writes detailed case study after case study, from tobacco to opioids to alcohol to sugar, and as one reviewer wrote, The connective tissue between them all involves doubt, denial, delay, distraction, deflection, and defense of the products in question. The book is full of scary examples, and I highly recommend it unless uh, you really like to drink wine and you don't want to know how bad it is for you. uh, Can we just ignore that part of it, Luigi? Can we just, (laughs) let's let's just skip that chapter, okay? (laughs) Let's just skip that chapter. I think the book is full of fascinating examples, like the fact that Purdue Pharmaceuticals, the inventor of oxycodone, um, financed a bunch of medical doctors who developed the theory of pseudo-addiction, which essentially posited that an addiction to opioids isn't a real addiction. I, I know, I know. But at the time, a lot of people either were convinced or, 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 or pretended to be convinced. I completely agree. But I want to push Michaels a bit farther. I want to see whether the main fault is just at the company level or at the university level or maybe a bit of both. And last but not least, what role do journalists play in all this? David, 
David, we thought we'd start by asking you to explain Big Tobacco for our listeners. In some ways, at least, Big Tobacco wrote the playbook for denial and misinformation. And is this still the playbook? And are things better or worse today than in the days of Big Tobacco? We call this the tobacco playbook, not because tobacco invented it, but because tobacco used it so successfully for so long uh, to such enormous profits and to kill so many people. The idea is to question the science related to the hazardous uh, result of exposure to a product. We really started to learn in the 1940s and 1950s that tobacco caused lung cancer, that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer. Eventually, we learned it caused many other conditions as well. At the suggestion of experts in the public relations industry, tobacco didn't say it doesn't cause cancer, but we need more research. We need to figure out much more And we shouldn't stop selling our product while we're doing this research and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And they essentially manufactured uncertainty. And it was successful because they could also say, look, to smokers, you look at the literature, you figure out whether uh, you're going to stop smoking or not, but you make the choice. That changed when the studies came out showing that tobacco smoke not only killed smokers, but caused lung cancer among non-smokers. At that point, tobacco became a public health issue And the industry had to really take a a much stronger position fighting the science. And so they came up with all sorts of new tactics, like get get the raw data from the studies, reanalyze it to make the results go away. That tobacco model is now, unfortunately, standard operating procedure for many industries. And in fact, some of the same uh, scientific consulting firms, even some of the same scientists who worked on tobacco decades ago, are still at it today doing that same work for producers of toxic chemicals, for example. You were obviously already pretty cynical about how this world works, given your previous book, when you started working on this book. Nonetheless, was there a particular case study that shocked even you? That's a great question. I think the one that really shocked me the most was Volkswagen. When first studies came out that showed that diesel engine exhaust increased risk of lung cancer, and Volkswagen had gone all in on diesel later Dieselgate came out, which it showed that they had software in their cars that didn't measure pollution in accurate ways. So it looked like the cars were getting great mileage, great pickup, and did not pollute, which was, of course, not true. But when the studies came out showing that diesel exhaust increased risk of lung cancer, some of the public relations people at Audi, which is a Volkswagen subsidiary, said, you know, we really need to respond to this. So let's do a study with humans where we'll put them in sort of chamber and we'll have them do exercise, we'll pump in air with diesel exhaust and show that it's not dangerous, even though that wouldn't look at cancer. But finally, someone pointed out to them that a German company putting people into chambers and pumping in a gas probably was, you know, their poor optics, I think was the word that was used. Sorry, not just one German company, that German company, because Volkswagen was a creation of Hitler. <laughs> That's right, the people's wagon. That's right, the people's car. Anyway, so they decide, well, we're going to, we'll do that with monkeys. And they brought a car, a Volkswagen, they drove it from LA and hooked in the tailpipe so they could pump it in. They had to have the monkeys watching TV to keep them calm. They watched cartoons while they were breathing in this. And they did the study all wrong, it turns out, the folks they hired. So they didn't find the result they want. And then the trade association that's run by Volkswagen said, well, we're not going to pay you till you get the right result. You know, Lily Tomlin once said, no matter how cynical I get, it's hard to keep up. And that (laughs) That one, I thought, uh, sort of won the prize. In in your book, you cite one of my favorite quotes by Upton Sinclair, that it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Clearly, in the case of tobacco, we had the smoking gun of this executive knowing that uh, how bad tobacco was and hiding it. Is it possible to distinguish between a, if you want, uh, what I call uh, psychopathic uh, executives who don't care about killing people just to make money, and some form of cognitive dissonance of the type of the one described by Sinclair, because I had a harder time believing that alcohol was bad for you, because I like alcohol, but I am ready to sign and jump on on American football. I find American football horrendous. I think it's a crime against humanity. I will stop it tomorrow, because I particularly don't enjoy it. To what extent there is this distortion? You know, I, I think you've hit upon an important point that we can learn a lot from the studies of the behavioral sciences. You could call it motivational reasoning. 
you could call it confirmation bias. And look, I can't put my myself in the heads of CEOs of, say, DuPont, who made these PFAS chemicals for a long time. I certainly am willing to concede they had no idea that it caused illness. They looked at the literature or what they were told by their staff, and they, they didn't believe it for, for perhaps good reasons, which is why I think we have to have systems where unconflicted experts examine the data. Because if you have a a uh, financial relationship with companies, whether it's football, whether it's a chemical, whether it's alcohol, I think there's a lot of evidence that you can't see what is obviously there and can be seen by people who are unconflicted. Luigi and I don't always agree on everything, but we actually do agree on alcohol and football. So I guess here's cheers to that. <laughs> Uh, a, f a follow up from that. If we're willing to give executives at companies at least the benefit of the, the, some degree of doubt in saying, do they actually do they actually fully understand? What about the scientists, the people who the people who run these consulting firms? Uh, you had some lines in your book. Um, you pulled from what some employees had said on Glassdoor about their employers, and you um, quoted one as saying, "Some of the principal scientists have questionable ethics," or another saying, "Sometimes you will be working." for evildoers and trying to make it seem like they, 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 they did nothing wrong. And so do you, do you think the scientists should, who serve as these consultants should be held to a higher standard? I do, because the business model of these companies, these scientific consulting firms, is to provide whatever product is that their client wants, where the purpose of these scientific consultant firms is to essentially obscure the truth and to ensure that dangerous products can stay on the market. They would be out of business if they started providing reports that said, well, you know, it's not clear and there's a reasonable shot that this chemical causes cancer. They, they wouldn't get any more jobs. So I think they should be held to a higher standard. In fact, there's lots of evidence that comes out in court cases saying, well, let's do it this. Let's do the study this way because, you know, we'll, this is what we'll find. One of the examples I talk about, the consultants hired by Johnson & Johnson 25 years ago when the United States National Toxicology Program was considering labeling talc as a potential carcinogen. Now, we know now that there's a been a huge fight over baby powder. Johnson Johnson actually finally has announced their stop selling talc-based baby powder. They could have done that 25 years ago, but instead they hired a company to essentially confuse the board of scientific counselors of the National Toxicology Program so they wouldn't label it as a carcinogen. In fact, the memos that came out in the lawsuit said, here's our objective, time for more confusion. So th that's pretty straightforward to me. That that's, that's why these firms exist. But the disturbing thing to me, at least, is not just that these firms exist, but they are kind of intermingled with academics. So if these firms exist and were completely in a separate universe, I said, okay, they, they exist. But why in the academic community we tolerate the presence of people who are back and forth. So in the academic world, you understand that, oh, no, you need to uh, prostitute yourself occasionally, and, but we don't really enforce this against you in, in this way. And this, to me, is reinforced by the fact that many expert opinions, at least in my field, I don't know in your field, but they're sealed and they, they're not disclosed. So I can uh, freely say something contrary to every knowledge in, in economics, and still get away with that because nobody can uh, refute that, uh, or at least my, the reputation that not spill over outside of the trial. So what can we do about that? Well, hey, well you raise a, a really important point. You know, we shouldn't be putting academics like ourselves on the pedestal. We are people with the same uh, financial needs, the same greed, the same concerns, the same uh, need for engagement and also for praise. But one thing we can do, I think, is demand transparency. You know, one of the things I did when I was running OSHA is I said that if you're going to be sending in comments around a regulatory procedure, you know, OSHA at the time was moving toward a new standard on silica exposure and on beryllium exposure, you should at least disclose who paid for your comments and if you have a financial conflict of interest. Certainly in the scientific world, in the biomedical world, you can't publish a paper anymore without disclosing that information. I don't know if it's true in economics. It, it, I would hope it would be, but the top journals all insist on that. But the U.S. government doesn't require that when you put comments into a regulatory proceedings. So we have no idea if when an academic puts comments in, who paid for it. Sometimes they will disclose it, but sometimes they won't. 
Uh, I would like to see universities be more transparent around the payments that go to academics and the, the work that they do. But I don't think we can stop them. But on the other hand, I think if we have full disclosure and transparency, it'll get us at least part of the way there. So theoretically, I love your idea of having independent scientists look at this and perhaps look at things. And perhaps I'm too cynical, but is there such a thing as real independence? And how do you how do you know what it is? And I see this all the time in corporate America, where you have a board member who is ostensibly independent by all the conventional definitions, yet that person craves being liked by management. And you can have a board member who is not independent, who may have financial ties to management, but who really doesn't give a damn and is happy to call things as, as, as she sees them. And so I worry about the same t- things with scientists, too. You could have a scientist who looks independent, but who wants the approval of corporate America. And you could have a scientist who doesn't look independent, but who actually is, is willing to call it as, as, as they see it. And so how do, you, how do you think about independence? And do you worry about that issue? I think there's a couple of good models out there. The one I like the most, and none of these are perfect, but the one I like the most is called the Health Effects Institute. It was set up jointly by the motor vehicle industry, you know, Ford, GM, what used to be Chrysler, etc., and the EPA. At the beginning, they each supplied half the budget. Now it's gotten more complicated because there are more parties involved. But they do studies, they commission studies. They're very transparent. They have a board of corporate people and government people. They really have contributed tremendously to our understanding of automobile-related air pollution. There have been a couple of studies that have come out that were very controversial. Uh, There's something called the Harvard Six Cities Study, where some Harvard epidemiologists put backpacks with exposure assessment devices on them in six cities, some with low pollution, some with high pollution, then looked at asthma and other respiratory diseases. The oil industry hated that study, or just the fossil fuel industry hated that study, but HEI commissioned a review of it, and they said, look, this study is a good study. Recently, there have been some studies done on the effect of diesel exposure, diesel exhaust, done in underground mines, because that's the only place you can get people who are exposed to only diesel exhaust and nothing else. And again, both parts of the diesel engine industry, like Navistar and the big oil producers, did not like that study. They claimed it was totally wrong. But then the Health Effects Institute looked at that and said, you know, this study, they did a review, the independent review, and said, no, this is a, you know, it's a good study. So I'm impressed that it can be done. Uh, it costs some money, but in the big picture, especially around that issue, it's it's a very inexpensive way to, to decide you know, what's good science and also what do we need to know to be able to protect people from air pollution? Since Luigi has just been beating up on his profession, I guess I should uh, beat up on mine. Shouldn't it be the job of the press to be able to uncover some of this and be able to say, this study is full of this is one you can trust. Is the information simply not there for the press to be able to do what ostensibly should be, should be our job? Or is the information available and the press is just failing to do its job? Well, I think the press is getting better. I think the climate crisis has led to a rejection of what we sometimes call both-siderism. Uh, reporters no longer try to get a spokesperson from the Heartland Institute or Exxon to say, no, this, this climate change stuff isn't real anymore. It, you know, that's in the past. And I think that's now expanding to other areas as well. It really does take a little bit of research to see that the expert or the firm that's commenting saying, well, this particular exposure isn't so dangerous. You know, if you go back and look at their history of all the different comments they've made in the past, you know, saying, for example, you know, the thing that's in the news right now, PFAS, the PFAS chemicals, the forever chemicals, you know, for years, 3M and DuPont hired a series of firms to essentially say there is no evidence that this is associated with any sort of uh, immunological outcome or, or cancer. We now know that isn't true. You know, there are tons and tons of studies showing the danger and the cost of cleaning this up are enormous in the many billions of dollars, which is unfortunate because if they had stopped ex- exposure 20 years ago, we'd be in much better shape. But the press doesn't go back and say, the folks who said this about PFAS also said this about asbestos and the tobacco, etc. It could be done. I get calls from reporters occasionally who read my book and say, wow, you know, I didn't know that these, this same scientist was working on this chemical or that chemical or the one before. Um, so I think uh, hopefully it'll get better. I think you should put together a database of conflicted scientists, and you should have every scientist be searchable for the work that they've done on previous, let's call them campaigns. Anyway. (laughs) Actually, Bethany, uh, beware what you wish for, because uh, we might create one like this at the Stiegler Center. I'm actually doing some research on conflict of interest in economics, where now we have disclosure, but it's voluntary disclosure. 
And I'm actually struggling, for example, to define what is a conflict because this is very subjective. Past conflicts are easier to determine in an objective way. The most tricky thing, in my view, are future conflict. So if I want to signal myself a good defender of the faith, I might not be paid for, but I am uh, much more aggressive in defending that in order to get a certain position. So if I were to, to say that CEOs are underpaid, uh, my chances of getting on, on a board is much higher than if I go around saying that they are paid too much and they should be curtailed. But until I get a board position, I don't have any verifiable conflict, but the conflict is there if I really want to achieve that. So that's, that's a problem, number one. Problem number two, if I genetically benefit from it, should I write all at the bottom of every op-ed, for example, all my conflict? And, and, and number three, if there is not an objective c- comparison, How do I know that you're not lying? The sanction for lying are basically non-existent. You're absolutely right. To your first point, I've seen plenty of evidence that some of these consulting firms look at uh, subjects they think will be lucrative for them, and they say, well, let's invest a little money, we'll write a paper, and that will make us the expert, and then we will get get hired to do it, uh, knowing that obviously their papers that they write will have to exonerate these chemicals, which is why I think For important issues where society needs to know what is the right answer, or at least what what we think is close to the right answer, it's worthwhile for for the government, somehow the society, to say, okay, we're going to hire some scientists, some experts to look at this subject who have no financial conflict, who have not related to this, to give us the answer. And it's sort of the model of the National Academy of Sciences, which works to some extent, but it's a very expensive, time-consuming process. You know, the other place this all is argued out, obviously, is in litigation. You know, equally, you've got competing scientists on both sides. Then you either have a judge or jurors who try to figure out, you know, which side is right. It's not an efficient system. There's huge frictional costs. People who should be compensated often aren't, and people who are compensated probably shouldn't be. But we don't really have a good system to deal with these. And so we need, we need to think about, is there investment that can be made that can make this system work much better? Expand on that a little bit, because I often think that in the U.S., the system, our, our litigation system does serve as a sort of regulation. In other words, private law firms are more than willing to bring big lawsuits where they see the hope of a payoff, and they serve as sort of an after-the-fact government enforcement or non-governmental enforcement mechanism. Why isn't that the right answer? I think it is an answer, and I certainly saw it up close. Um, I worked on a chemical called diacetyl, which isn't so well known, but it's the um, butter flavor chemical that was used in uh, butter popcorn. It was associated with a condition that you heard about 15 years ago, but don't hear about anymore, called popcorn lung. It was discovered in a um, microwave popcorn factory in Missouri, where they changed the formula and more than 10 workers had their lungs destroyed. They actually had to get uh, lung transplants. Numerous cases were then discovered in other popcorn factories, in a buttermilk pancake factory, and various things. And there were immediate lawsuits, and there were about $100 million in awards and settlements within a few years. At that point, before I was the um, administrator of OSHA, I had written that OSHA should issue an emergency standard to protect workers from diacetyl. By the time I got to OSHA two years later, the industry had stepped in, the trade association called FEMA, the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association. You know, they had the, they had the, the uh, acronym 100 years before, you know, the, the, the emer- uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, FEMA had stepped in with all the manufacturers of diacetyl and said, you can't use diacetyl anymore for any sort of food flavoring that people could inhale. You, it's safe to eat. And so in, regulation had solved the problem even before OSHA could get to it. And we've taken OSHA years to get to it. OSHA is under-resourced. So it certainly is effective that litigation and fear of litigation really does have a big impact, but it's also too late. You know, that only occurs after people get sick. And for cases that are less clear, it doesn't happen. What I'd like to see is moving toward a situation where we protect people from exposures before we have to prove that they've killed people. You know, for OSHA, for example, it's only after you show that there's tremendous harm been done, you begin to move toward a regulation. It takes years to issue the regulation. And and even if exposure stops, the long tail of disease it caused will go on for decades. And so litigation can be more effective than regulation, but but I prefer to see a regulatory system that says, 
well, this chemical looks like it could be causing illness or this, this um, exposure. Let's figure out how to protect people before people get sick, because neither the current regulatory system or litigation does that. Now, your book is full of uh, tragic stories, in part is because they're selected to be tragic. There's nothing bad about it. But I would like to know the non-tragic story. So I think that at some point, one of my other addictions is coffee, is uh, at some point coffee was considered dangerous. There was one uh, uh, article about this. When, when is right to jump? And it says, you could argue that uh, based on that article, you should prevent everybody from drinking coffee. Now, Bethany and I would revolt, and so probably we'll have another 100 million Americans on that. So when, when is the right time to intervene and when the intervention is too early? No, absolutely. That's the big issue. Of course, I remember that the pancreatic cancer and coffee study from, you know, 30 years ago or so that put the fear of God into everyone who drank coffee. And turned out to be wrong. And that's, that's certainly going to happen. I think what you need then, as I've said before, I think you need this impartial regulatory system that can really weigh things out. One study is not enough. In a case like coffee, where we have tens of millions of people exposed on a daily basis, we probably, in that case, should launch studies. We should pay for studies to be done to figure out that question. Where it's, it's very different when you have something that isn't yet on the market and say, okay, what can we, how can we determine whether this should go on the market versus something that's out there a great deal that we really need to figure out, is it making people sick? And it's never going to be easy. I mean, these are, these are tough questions because you can't just study them in people. You know, if we could randomize coffee exposure, take half the people and give them, you know, six cups a day for 30 years and the other random half not, we could answer the question. But you can't do that with people. So we have to use animal studies and, you know, analogies and things like that. It's, it's a challenge. To what extent the United States are worse than other developed countries in this dimension? Because in many instances in your book, the, I think is IARC, the International Association for the Research of Cancer, calls things much earlier than the correspondent uh, American uh, Institute. Why we're doing so poorly? In the United States, we don't have a nimble regulatory system. You know, most of our regulatory requirements are based on this idea that an exposure is innocent until proven guilty. But with a chemical, you have to go to a much higher standard. We have to say, okay, this is causing illness, therefore we're going to protect people. Where IARC, for example, just has to say, this is what we think. Because our regulatory system is part of a legal system, we know, for example, OSHA takes a decade or more to issue a standard. The requirements based on the OSHA law and then court decisions say OSHA has to go through these various steps and make these various proofs. And if OSHA makes a mistake anywhere in there, they will lose in court afterwards because every health standard is taken to court. So it just takes a long time. So our system is, is built not for speed. It's durable in that once a regulation is issued, it really, in almost all cases, has a really significant effect. But it takes so long to get there that there's a big price to be paid by people who have these exposures before that. You know, heat is an example right now. It's, I get calls all the time about heat. OSHA does not have a heat standard. It will take years, even in, in this period when we have workers exposed to deadly levels of heat. For OSHA to issue a standard to protect workers from heat will take several years at least. Can you make that, symbol, that system more nimble? Congress could do that, but Congress, of course, is paralyzed. I think I would like to think that we can do something without necessarily involving Congress because that becomes hopeless. So you teach in a school of public policy, if I'm not mistaken. So here at the University of Chicago, we have a survey that another center organizes here where we ask a bunch of economists across the, the country, what is their opinion on, on something, okay? And the economists answer, and they provide a short explanation for the answer. So I think this would be incredibly helpful to have something like this by a panel of independent experts in the various fields on issue of the day. So I'm old enough to actually remember the article on the coffee and scare the hell out of me. So I read an article on the, on the coffee. Should I jump and stop drinking coffee? I look at the panel and I have a panel of independent experts that say the evidence is not enough for the moment to do that. Ten years later or three years later, depending on the study, they say actually uh, there is evidence or there is not evidence. And the, the beauty is that the journalists could actually look at it, see the explanation, the only thing to, to be done is, is to make sure that these people are non-conflicted, that might be uh, different, and picking a panel of sufficient variety of experts. But 
that would be very helpful also, honestly, in litigation, because what, what I fear there is lack of is precisely of independent opinion. So the IAC is good because if I go on litigation and say it's been mentioned as probable cause of cancer by IAC, and this carry, carries some role. Uh, so if you say is mentioned as cause of cancer by an independent panel of experts at the uh, University of Washington, that's something. I think that's a great idea. Now, you know, I'm in a school of public health, George Washington University School of Public Health. I've seen that sort of panel before around COVID, which was a great idea because the science was changing and the exposures were changing on a regular basis. So, for example, the New York Times surveyed a bunch of epidemiologists saying, what are you doing now? Are you flying? Are you eating in restaurants inside? I think that was that was terrific to see. First, there's some range of, of response, but also you get a sense of what's going on. So that's certainly something that would be worth considering. So if I can follow up one second, Bethany, on this, because I think that I actually think that in the case of the pandemic was done in, in the wrong way because it was asking precisely your preferences. And honestly, I don't care about your preferences. I care about your expert opinion of risk. So this is where knowing, is this a cancerogenic, knowing the evidence or not? This is where an expert can say yes or no. Whether knowing that it's carcinogenic, whether you want to drink it or not, that's a personal preference. So I, unfortunately, I learned from your book, I was trying to avoid this, I learned from the book that actually alcohol at any level is carcinogenic. Uh, makes me very sad. I still drink it. I try to drink less, but I still drink it. That's a personal choice. But, but I think that the, on the objective part, I don't find myself, and I'm a pretty informed reader, I don't find myself a place to go is, is this particular substance cancerogenic and with what probability. But look at the issue. Let's say you're concerned about uh, cosmetic products or shampoos, for example. You can't look at the side of your shampoo bottle, which lists, you know, 50 different chemicals and say, you know, which ones of these are safe? Should I use this? So you need a system which is going to answer those questions in more detail and also encourage removal of certain chemicals from, ex from potential exposure. But, but it's certainly, there are ways to get there that we haven't, you know, we haven't really considered or gotten there yet. And I think it's probably something we should be thinking about. I have one last question, which is one of my obsessions, especially in the field of economics, is that more than money, data can corrupt you. Because a lot of firms, and uh, think about certainly digital platforms, but not only them, own a lot of very valuable data. If you get access, exclusive access to Amazon data, Uber data, whatever, I think you can get tenure at a top university just writing paper with those data. Uh, but no money exchange ends. And, you know, companies pick only certain people to use their data. And this is, if you have a history of exposing things, you are the last one to be granted that data. I think that universities should be much more attentive in this dimension. And, and one thing I would like to ask, because a colleague in the medical department tells me that many companies finance large studies, randomized studies, but they own the data of the research. And by owning the data, they can stop publication if they want to. So I think it should be illegal for people at university to work in this condition. The university should put a barrier that anything that people research at university cannot be blocked from publication because otherwise we're not independent research, we're a PR effort. You know, you're right. And there have been a couple of examples in the biomedical world where people had moved toward publishing a study that the owner of the data blocked them. So now many of the leading medical journals and the International Association of Medical Journal editors uh, require first authors to sign a disclosure that they had the unfettered right to publish and they did not have to approve it and also that they did not review the results with the source of the data. It still raises the question about getting access. And obviously, if you're not someone who an industry trusts, you won't get access. But I think we have made some progress in that area, that you can't publish in, in New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA now um, unless you say you had the unfettered right to publish. So at least we're getting somewhere in that area. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was lovely chatting with you both. Thank you. I think that uh, what he's doing is very useful, and I don't want in any way undermining what he's, what he's doing, but I want to make sure that we understand two things. Number one is, what is the optimal behavior that you should follow? In a sense, if you are 
a company and all of a sudden they tell you that your product kill people, like maybe the coffee, should you stop producing coffee? You're gonna try to ask some experts to tell you whether the coffee is really dangerous or not. To what extent you actively seek bias experts, which I'm sure is the case in a lot of cases, and to what extent the experts naturally bias themselves in your favor. So if, if I hire a consultant, the consultant, the first question that I learn from the consultant is they learn how not to piss off their boss because otherwise they're not rehired. So is it the fault of the companies or the fault of the scientists? And I think is, of course, as usual, a little bit of both, but how can we fix it? I think we need to put a mechanism in place on both sides. I really liked that he was not dogmatic about the notion that, that these were bad people setting out to do bad things and that it is a uh, case-by-case basis. In some cases, it is bad people do it, setting out to do bad things. And in other cases, it is people with motivated reasoning or people who who are simply blinded blinded by confirmation bias. I, I agree that his, his search for independence is a little more fraught. Finding somebody who is truly independent is tricky because all of us have have hidden biases on top of that science by its nature can be can be wrong per your great example about coffee you can come up with an example of a product that appears to hurt people and then it can turn out that the whole the whole thing was wrong and not because anybody intended intended to be wrong and so then is the right thing for a company to do to yank its product off the market as soon as somebody says this 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 might be dangerous that seems to set up a whole series of problems in in the other direction i think what he's getting at is to come up with a, a way to force the incentives for a corporation to be different, a mechanism that is timelier than litigation. So the incentive for a company is, how do we get to the bottom of this? How do we find out what the truth is? Rather than, even if that process isn't perfect, and even if truth itself is sometimes actually really is debatable, but how do we do the best job we possibly can to get it to get at truth? Rather than one that incentivizes companies to say, how do we make sure we prolong this for as long as possible by, and I loved David's phrase, manufacturing uncertainty. Yeah, so one important element in my view that emerges from the book is that companies very often use industry associations to perform these dirty tricks. And this is interesting because they kind of dissociate themselves from the responsibility. So all the stories about sugar or about alcohol, they're not attributed to that particular sugar company or that particular alcohol company. It is more a collective part of the, uh, the industry. And certainly no individual football team has taken responsibility for what the National Football League has done, okay? As a result, the individual teams get away literally with murder because they are protecting themselves with this uh, pseudoscience and they don't bear any individual reputational cost. Yeah, that's fascinating, the way in which big might allow the ev- evasion of responsibility because it no, there no longer is reputational damage if people don't associate a product with a company because the company makes so many products that who remembers who, who, who makes what. But I think your point also about the way in which the damage is deflected to an association is, 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 is really interesting. I don't think I can ever think about associ- associations in quite the same way, again, after hearing about what, what FEMA, the fragrance... Um, what, <laughs> but now I think every time I hear an, an acronym that stands for some sort of association behind behind which hides all these awful things, I think I'm always going to have to think twice about what the acronym actually is, because it is kind of funny, too, the use of these bland acronyms and these very bland names to hide, uh, to, and you're right, to serve as a public interface in a way that allows the deflection of any kind of accountability. But did you understand what he said that actually that substance I can't pronounce that sounds like butter is still used everywhere as long as you don't inhale I, it, I, I, which doesn't make me very confident. No, <laughs> I, I know. I wasn't sure whether to whether to pause on the fact that a movie theater buttered popcorn, which is one of the delights of the world, may actually be really terrible for you, or whether to pause on the, wait, 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 the stuff is still being made as long as you don't inhale it and somehow you can ingest it. But it, if you don't inhale, one one I-N word is okay and one I-N word is not okay. Uh, we should have pushed, asked him more about that, but it felt, it felt like like a tangent at the time. <laughs> Maybe it's not. It's popcorn after all. I think that, yeah, it's interesting because there was a, a big uproar and boycotting on one side or another on the issue of Kaepernick in the uh, NFL. 
and I'm not saying that's not an important issue, but the issue that they might end up killing their players, but nobody boycotted any NFL organization for, as a result of that. The case of uh, the National Football League is particularly bad. Okay, and it says there, there are cases that are more ambiguous, and, and actually I appreciate it because I did do independent research on the DuPont case. He describes it as more balanced in that particular case, that people uh, took some time to figure out how lethal this stuff was. At least for a number of years, they put uh, a quasi best effort in finding out because one thing is saying we're going to try, the other thing is pretend that we're going to try. But in the, in the NFL case, they didn't even try. They, in my view, they, uh, they really manufactured doubts right away in a way that is very dangerous. And I think there has been a conspiracy of silence on this. And it says, do you know the fact that we know from some hacking the NFL pressures Sony to make the movie Concussion less uh, brutal in order to pre preserve its franchise. The problem that the sole cost of this is borne by the football players themselves after they've left the league, with no cost borne by the league and no cost borne by the, by the fans. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I are having on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should also check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories. It's not told through opinions and anecdotes, but rather through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. So if you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Do you remember the old New York Magazine? I, I keep coming back to this. They had this wonderful chart in every issue of the magazine, and it would be it would be an axis and divided into quadrants. And one um, one axis would be uh, brilliant to stupid, and the other axis would be highbrow to lowbrow. So something that was in the news that week would either could land in the upper right hand quadrant, which would be both brilliant and highbrow, or it could land in the brilliant and lowbrow category. And I think any I think a lot of life can be simplified by thinking of things in in, in quadrants. And so I was thinking the access for products maybe should be are there ex who bears the cost of the externalities? That should be one axis that the company itself bears bears the cost, or 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 people disconnected with it bear the cost. And the other um, axis should be: Can people understand the risks of this themselves, or can they not understand the risks without an expert? And if something goes in the quadrant where outsiders bear all the costs of this going wrong and people have no chance of understanding it for themselves, then it should be subject, it should be thought about differently than something that goes in the quadrant where the company itself is going to bear all the costs of whatever, of, of something going wrong. And people, consumers actually could do their homework and figure it out for themselves, right? <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And, and to some extent, we economists are liable of thinking only on the dimension of externality versus non-externality and only very recently we are more attuned with the fact that not everybody is perfectly well informed. That's an important dimension, but this is where the dimension, I'm sorry to say, of the media world at large is important. Because the point I wanted to make is, and I agree that information is not enough, but there's not even that information. It says how many reminders, how many articles about this there are daily, uh, and it says, in every package of cigarettes, you see cigarettes cause cancer. Uh, you don't have in every football ball a statement saying football kills your brain. Yeah, and I just I, I always thought that after the um, a version of that after the two thousand and eight financial crisis, where I thought every time you're signing a mortgage, you should just be forced to read big skip all the complicated disclosure that all the regulators decided on. All it needs to say is across the top when you're signing your mortgage is about the mortgage broker you're working with. I am not working in your I'm not working in your interest. I'm trying to sell you this product, and and I'm acting like your friend and your advisor, but I'm actually not. And and if 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 they're <laughs> big letters across the top of every page that said that, then people would probably approach signing a mortgage a little bit differently, right? Absolutely. That's an excellent idea. Yeah, because I think I think part of what goes wrong in our I used to be much more hardcore about the idea of personal responsibility. And and I still am to some extent because I think that without a basic belief in personal responsibility, we're we're all wrong. Or we're all we're all lost. But yet a lot goes wrong in the games we all play where 
someone pretends to be your friend and, and, and they're not. And you can say that a sophisticated person should be able to see through that and understand that the person is marketing themselves as your advisor and your, and your friend and, and, and they're not. But face it, we don't live in a world where everybody has the, the privilege of being sophisticated. And I think that's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's a real problem. Absolutely. On top of this, the ability and the scary part is the ability of this uh, efforts done by corporation and industry association is that they really change the perception that most people have of the risk. The idea that actually the biggest co- cause of heart diseases is, is uh, or the only cause of heart disease is fat has been so pervasive. And now reading the book, you figure out the sugar is at least as bad. The claim in the book is that uh, this obsession with fat was a clever push by the sugar industry that made sure that you go in that direction. Even when you eat meat, you know that the hamburger in McDonald's, there's some sugar in it because people like sugar. So they put sugar everywhere and you get addicted to sugar even without knowing because you don't know what is in those products. But so let's talk about solutions because we're being uh, belly aching enough that we need to think about uh, solution. I think that the the idea of having some uh, scientist expert opinion on, on, on matter of facts that are aggregated with what is majority things, but also see the variation and the explanation written in a few words, I think would be very useful. Now, this is not useful, of course, for the unsophisticated people, so a, l- a little bit self-serving because it will be very useful for you and I, but it's at least the beginning. It would be incredibly useful for a journalist because I can't help thinking about all the things that, that journalists get wrong. And the, the, the reality is that journalists come at a lot of stories with motivated reasoning. And if you can find a study that says something that works for your article or your point of view, then you will use it without investigating whether the study in question is actually done well. And that happens all the time. But even when that doesn't happen, are most journalists under time pressure capable of getting to the bottom of what a study actually says and what it doesn't say when even scientists themselves aren't necessarily capable of it? When, when figuring out what the study says and what it doesn't say is sometimes so complicated that it has to be litigated in court? I, I, I don't know. And if there were an independent third-party body that you could go to and say, hey, about this study, that, that, it, would, it would go a long way, even if that third-party's work weren't always perfect. It would go a long way because it would very quickly if the body were credible, it would be very quickly be best practices in the press to have to call that body before you quoted a study. And that would, in and of itself, start to cut down on the propagation of dubious studies because you'd you'd know, right? (laughs) It would be obvious that somebody sought to cite a dubious study if they didn't make that phone call. As a journalist myself, I can tell you how important it is for reporters, especially business reporters, to develop a deeper understanding of the subjects we're covering. The Stigler Center's Journalist in Residence program offers paid training in the fundamentals of economic and business at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. And there are other perks. Learn more and apply now at chicagobooth.edu slash stiglerjir. So did you have one big takeaway from this episode that you thought was that, that, that made you excited? I think I was excited about this idea of the expert panel that could uh, make a difference. And uh, we need to find mechanisms to enforce reputation more effectively. Uh, we're not very good at that. And as a result, a lot of people and a lot of corporations get away with literally murder. And, and in some cases, is very difficult in a sense when you have phenomena that take uh, 30 years to materialize, it's very hard to keep people accountable. But also that's that should be the level of strictness of products, et cetera, because when a product kills you right away, even corporations are very good at dealing with it. And the example of uh, the popcorn is, is a leading one. What is very problematic is when things kills you slowly and with a small and viable probability Even detecting it is hard, proving close to impossible, enforcing liability, extremely rare, enforcing reputation, zero. So from a regulatory point of view, maybe we should actually do something about the small probability but high cost risk that are precisely the one that are 
order ignored by everybody, including the regulators. Because, you know, if you are a regulator, are you really going to put up a fight for something that is going to materialize 30 years from now? Uh, unless you are really, really public spirited, probably not. I like that idea. A question on it. If you were to create this independent body, if you, if you could, if you could design it and will it into being, who would you have funded? Because you can't have it funded by corporate America. Um, you can't really have it funded by Congress because Congress is bought by corporate America. So who would, who would fund it in a way to keep it independent? So I don't think so much is the funding is the allocation of the funds. So you can easily impose or require a tax for uh, the corporation that every, every time they introduce a new product, they put a certain amount into a fund to study those products, but they don't control who does the study. But that's only deflecting your very good question, which is who is going to allocate, who is going to do that? Yes, that's, and, um, you anticipated my follow-up. <laughs> of course. Thank I, you. I know you enough to know that uh, <laughs> I cannot deflect you easily with that. Uh, no, I, no, I wanted to. So I think that that's, that's a real question. You know, my natural inclination would be that I would like to have some real scientists to do that. The problem is, number one, how do you pick it? And number two, what I learned over the years is once you design an independent institution, you're making it very attractive as a target to be bought off. When uh, agencies were created at the beginning, they were very independent over time. They are really captured. So I had two takeaways, one perhaps small, but I really did like this notion of the, the various costs of bigness because I've always thought of the cost of our society of giant corporations is that they're unmoored from communities, so they don't have to bear responsibility to the communities in which they live because the CEO isn't going to run into somebody he sold a bad product to at the local country club or or whatever. But this idea that there's another cost of bigness in the evasion of reputational damage, that it just is impossible to keep track of who sells what. And, and so when it comes to something like Merck, Merck and Vioxx, it just doesn't do that much damage because nobody remembers to associate Vioxx with Merck. Maybe it's not a huge part of our podcast, but I but I thought about that. And the other thing I thought about is actually more of a, a life issue. I thought for all the <laughs> for all the uncertainties and vagaries of, of journalism today, I thought how lucky I am to have found my way to to journalism because I remember being a banker and an M and A banker specifically. Although banker is too august a word for what I did, I was so junior. But that was motivated reasoning at its best. You weren't trying to get to the right answer; you were trying to get to the answer that was right. In other words, when you put a valuation on a company, you were trying to get to a certain number. You weren't trying to figure out what the company was actually worth. And I thought, what a privilege it's been to be able to work in a field where whether I've gotten it right or not, and there are things I've gotten right and there are things I've gotten wrong, but at least I've always been trying to get to the truth and trying to get to the right answer. And I thought for anybody who's listening who is young, maybe that's a framework to help think about what you what you want to do. Is, is, is the work you're going into one where you really get to be engaged in a search for the, for the truth? Or is it one where there are going to be constant forces on you to be getting to the answer that is right, not the right answer? Um, I love that. And honestly, that's the way I feel about my own profession. Uh, but uh, I don't think that uh, everybody feels the same way in academia or in, uh, in journalists. But I think that uh, certainly both academia and journalists give opportunities to people to, to do that. And, and I'm very happy to have made a choice. We end in agreement. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also, check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Lita Sees Rain, with production assistance from Utsov Gandhi, Sebastian Burka, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts.